Okay. Um, so, I guess, do we just want to start by introducing everyone? Everyone go around and introduce and say, if you're on the current steering committee, saying what your current position is. Sandra, do you want to yeah, join okay. us? Come over here in the middle, lady. Yeah. See if we can. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, Nick Dean, chair. Um, Sandra Avalos, communication coordinator. And then we have our special yeah. guest. I'm Patty Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I am. But <laughs> <laughs> She's our guest. Paul, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, Paul Alexander. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I'm messing around with the uh, settings on this video. It's okay. <sighs> I'm Karen Wright, Membership Coordinator. Okay. Is that everybody? I think Heather. Oh, Heather, did you step out? Okay. I think she's around. Okay, she's there, but she's muted. Muted? Yeah, possibly. Um, okay, so I think we just wanted to invite Patty to meet with us today because I think she had some things she wanted to share as far as like can history and how things have run in the past. So, um, really just want to see what your thoughts were, Patty and C. Kind of how did this organization okay. start? Yeah. So, in 1993 is when um, CAN first became a group. I wouldn't say that it was completely organized at that point, but the motivation at that point was to bring people together from across the state of Kansas. Um, a lot of those people at the time were involved with Nakata, but outside of the region conference really didn't have a method. Um, and I think at that point was when most of the people in Region 7 were also developing their state organizations as well because we're one of the few um, regions in, the, in Nakata, globally now, um, that actually has a state organization. And we are not technically a Nakata organization. We've never been a Nakata organization. We've been an allied member, which basically means that um, from a perspective, we would be listed on their website. People could reach out to us who come to the state. We could um, have a different opportunity for advertising things related to CAN. So the Nakata membership list, um, even though the membership list isn't technically provided to CAN, it, they will, if you're drafting emails and things, they will send things out, you know, if you're asking to send things to other states that we border, if you are wanting to do a state, um, like a mini drive-in where you invited other people who were close, especially like some of the times when we've been in the Kansas City area, we have had people from the Missouri side participate. Mm -hmm just because it was closer for them than doing some other things over time. So the real idea was to bring people together that were not just regents institutions and be able to share in some professional development so everyone wasn't recreating the wheel because a lot of people were really taking the opportunity, not that there weren't advisors before, but prior to that time, the bulk of people who were advisors were faculty advisors. And so being able to come up, you know, Nakata was up and running at that point. What would that look like? Um, because we needed to do it ourselves. Because at that point, in 1993, there were only two people that actually worked in the Nakata executive office. And that would have been Bobby Flaherty and Diane Madison. They were a, a two-man show in a very, very small um, space out at what used to be the Farm Bureau building, whatever you refer to it as now. To me, it's still the Farm Bureau building. But they just really did not have the capacity at that point um, to help people necessarily at the state level. The region, I mean, it was a lot just organizing the regions and different things at that point. So the idea was to come together and share, um, you know, issues. We were involved when the state actually passed, the, well, when the region, um, Board of Regents passed the baseline in May of 1999. And so that fall when we actually had our conference, that was the focus of our conference was understanding because a lot of the region schools, that information had never trickled down. People didn't know um, 
what was actually happening at that point. And so that was the first time that we, you know, reached out to do the Board of Regents. Then the second time we reached out with the Regents, and part of this was not to eliminate people who were in private um, schools, but we've just really not ever been able to get consistent membership from the private schools in our state. And since the Regents do control technically the community and technical schools and the four-year universities, we had them do the Foresight 2020 because that was important. And really, when you read Foresight 2020, that came down and touched the work that advisors do, whether they're professional faculty advisors, it did not matter. Um, that work was going to touch everybody. And so really having an idea of your institution's moving to something because the region said they would, but what is your role there? And what does that look like? Which was why we had Andy come when we were at Emporia last time, because that was the new thing at that point. And it was apparent that the knowledge had not been shared across institutions and things. So that was kind of the original focus. Um, we came in completely as a nonprofit just because we don't have expertise. We don't really have money to be paying accountants and you know work through that to be identified as a as a nonprofit for tax reasons with the IRS as well. And so part of that is you know maintaining a lower budget um, because if you're truly a nonprofit, you're putting all the money back into your organization um, with a plan. You have an elected, it's not called, CAN doesn't call it a board, but basically that committee serves in that same capacity, you know, and no one works for the organization as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm not sure what, what questions you guys have, because I know, so back in, trying to think when we, so it must have been back in 13. Um, we had collected all of the information and scanned everything that we could get from anyone. So old notebooks that were that Diane Coleman had, had years ago at WSU um, that she had left when she left WSU as a retired person. But you know, going through to bring all those documents together, which you should be able to see all of them in the Google Drive because the idea was to go through the scanning and the things that we had the most of was the past chair information, which was kind of like the conference information over time, the Region 7 information, the secretarial information, which is what we were able to retrieve um, from Diane Coleman that went from 1998 to 2003. And then basically the vice chair um, was the person who kind of had the records stuff with it. So when were the conferences, what meetings did we have, what did professional development look like, you know, over time, and um, the change in the bylaws that came, I want to say, was it early? Because it's been in the last 10 years, yeah. Because in 2005 they were changed and then they were revisited again with adjustments made um, in 2013 was the last time um, that those things had happened. So being able to go back um, and revisit that, to, part of it was to kind of bring the organization current mm -hmm. because things just change, you know. Um, having a technology, per, you know, that was never an issue years ago. Everything was just pretty much, you know, printed minus the, the newsletter um, was something that was, you know, a bit different. and Social stuff. Right, right. I mean, there was no social media. so you know, being able to be at that point and to start thinking about what does that actually mean because having a website back in the early, mid-2000s is very different than what that means now because things are interactive and they were just static. Mm -hmm. I mean, truly static before. You could never register. Everybody registered either um, via fax with a credit card number, which we all know now is extremely unsafe. <laughs> um, but, you know, back then we were talking about PCI compliance. But, you know, being able to, and so most people filled out the form. They would put all the people from their school together or their department at their school, and one check would come from the state um, with a purchase order if the check wasn't in with the registration. So just very different from a perspective of where you know, that we have been. And over time, doing different things outside of the conference. Um, so that, 
you know, we had different times when people would host webinars um, at different locations and invite others, you know, that would be close by. What would that actually look like? We were able to buy a, a lot of professional development DVD series, um, which are, um, you know, for the organization that people were able to check out and different things, which, you know, now that movement, because those things are copyright protected and Nakata, you know, they have a different view of that now. Um, of what that looks like. So when you're purchasing, you're purchasing as an institution, you're not really purchasing any longer, you know, as an organization um, and, you know, sharing passcodes for webinars and things like that. So it's a one place license until things go up on YouTube, which then are free once they're loaded onto YouTube by Nakata. Had, in the past, have y'all ever done any drive-ins? We have. Um, I'm trying to think. So we did trying to think who, so Tamara was still in, so in my mind I'm trying to think when that would have been, because we did one at Hayes that at the same time that I want to say KU hosted, because we drew like Colby, Dodge, Garden, Liberal, and the Kansas City Community Colleges and things were drawn into KU, and Wichita people had the opera, I mean, you know, they're kind of whichever way you wanted to go at that point. And there's always been talk about doing more things that are related to very current issues because um, it's probably been four years ago there was a large conversation um, after multiple people in the region system attended the Title IV training um, in Wichita. And they were just there because their positions not didn't have anything mm -hmm. to do with CAN, but talking about doing some different things with Title with Title Four. So what would that look like? Because so much of that um, does touch our students, because most of us have, have students who do repayment. And what do those things look like? Um, federal regulation, of course, has not allowed for flexibility in that now. So I don't know that that's as much of a current issue. Title Nine, of course, mm -hmm. you know, and what that has now become and what that looks like you know, just from a perspective of being able to provide other types of things. I think there's a great opportunity now that the professional competencies have come out um, to be able to think about what would that look like if you were wanting to do different types of training, um, you know, and truly focus. So whether you would do that within a conference, you know, because there have been many times when we would talk about we want to focus for the conference and really get people to come into different things, but that's just never really materialized enough um, outside of what would be like a, a panel representing multiple schools as like the keynote piece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what would that actually look like? Because a lot of schools, from an advising standpoint, cannot afford to p to pay for professional development um, because. The money is committed other ways, oftentimes for faculty um, professional development than it, more than it is for professional staff. And the bulk of our membership has, is professional now. You know, I wouldn't say that that was the case in the beginning because we had a variety of people who even sat on the board. The Lichtes both over time were from Emporia. They were both faculty members. That was their role. We had people from WSU who that was their role. Um, when the Lichtes moved off, Dwight Moore came in, who was a biology faculty member at Emporia. So there's just been a variety of different, but that membership now, I would say, you know, when I go and I look around the room, I would say it's probably 90 to 95% of the people are professional or administrative roles with in advising. And so, you know, what does that look like? Um, you know, from a perspective, being able to put the money back in, even if that's, you know, over time, so, because we would always have a budget for the year, and then, which would include things not conference, and then we would have a conference budget, just so that we would know the conference always needed to pay for itself. And that really depends on institutions you go to, but as soon as you've locked down on an institution, you know what their cost is. That was always the thing of, mm -hmm. what does that play yeah. into? Um, I know a lot of us, if, if you're hosting the conference, have really reached out to try to get support from your institution. 
you know, for us to cover different things yeah. and, and what would that actually look like being able to add, you know, additional things on, which is, you know, that's more flexibility at some schools than it is others. And so it just kind of depends, you know, who can you get to, to put money, money in and, you know, what are the things that we could really do to, to build more community, um, you know, more networking. And that's, we've talked about person. a lot about that, like how can we get a little more networking yeah. and more community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know there are people, like different state organizations, that will hold a chat even on a certain topic, right? So, you know, maybe that's something even um, in doing what's called an unconference, which is different than, I mean, there's a category usually within your conference that are unconference things which more revolve around things similar to what we used to do as round tables um, and different things and you'd read about when people could move around um, okay. so they would have an opportunity to get a lot of quick information mm -hmm. um, but what would that look like we always did that after lunch just to get people moving because right. we've never served a a light lunch, I don't yeah. think ever. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's always been, you know, what does that actually look like? But really trying to, to get others, you know, to get involved. And I think that's, you know, financially right now for a lot of people, that is a true issue. But, you know, what does that realistically look like? Is it that a school is saying, we're going to send X people? and you need to choose or get on a rotation or something because we have schools that do the rotation yeah. for CAN, the region, and then the annual mm -hmm. of what that looks like. So you get to go to one of each every right. year, but you're on a three-year rotation. So unless, you know, CAN is in your neighborhood where you're not paying hotel and yeah. things because that becomes a very different conversation from a, from a budget stand, mm -hmm. you know, where you're looking to be, so... Um, how do you think we can get more graduate students involved in CAN? Especially since here at Kansas State University we have mm -hmm. academic advising master's degree. Right. How do you have any ideas for that? So are you talking about the on-campus population primarily or are you... Yeah, I mean it would be great to get the ones that are off-campus but at, you know, still attending, still in Kansas but... At a Kansas yeah, institution. Yeah, they're online with... Yeah. So... Because I know we wouldn't get like people from right. Missouri or New York or anything like that yeah. to kind of get them. Yeah, because actually there's a piece, so for most people in a master's program that's related to higher ed, whether it's advising or whatever, there's a piece that's a practicum or an internship. Because even the people who are doing higher ed programs that want to focus mm -hmm. on the advising, because mm -hmm. I know some institutions, like our institution would allow a grad student if they wanted to take the advising certificate and bring it into a master's program in higher ed so that they would have a focus that's more you know geared toward that um, but then of course we have grad students who because that's not going to be covered you yeah. know if if you have a grad student who has some kind of tuition coverage that usually right. doesn't apply I mean it might at K-State but for other institutions yeah. You know, there's not a break um, like what you would be getting. And I think part of that is the first group that you really have to go after are those people that are doing practicums and assistantships in advising, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of encourage them um, at our institution because we have grad students who work in our office and that's an expectation of them. The first year it is not expectation at all that because, you know, you just got hired and we have a conference in September. But, you know, attendance is expected. It is covered by our office. And I think part of that goes to what does your school do to make that affordable for them? We also have a student organization called Saga where they can apply for other money. But I know there are groups around. I always write a mini action plan that allows professional development just for our GAs. So what does that mean? We're never going to have enough money to send them to annual unless it's in Kansas City or, yeah. you know, which that's not going to be a lot for a long time. But, um, you know, from a region, depending on if it's someplace we, that's drivable, right. you know, you're throwing them in with you and, you know, they're not extra people. But I think part of that is really having that conversation and depending on how your institution structures their master's degree, 
about what it means to be involved and have that opportunity to network and learn that there are different ways that people approach different things. That just because you're in our program at our institution and we do something this way, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean every institution does it that way. And so what does that actually look like? And, and how different is that if you're an on-campus versus a virtual program, which we have both in our higher ed um, program. But what does that look like? Because I think there's a piece of that that is reaching out to the institutions, identifying maybe at the institutions. But I think, you know, from a practicum, I we have a grad student. They can't do a practicum in our area. So they can't do an advising practicum if they're in an advising office for their GA. So they have to do something different. And, you know, if we can build a stronger network, there might be opportunities for people to go other places in the summer to work with practicums, knowing that they're not paid practicums um, type thing. But, you know, through that structure, if we were more consistent, I think, in getting out the message and, you know, what can we do for your program with your GAs? You know, we can provide, especially with CAN, a very affordable, typically, opportunity. But I think part of that, too, is getting, so next year, um, they will be on proposals that are submitted for CAN. They will be on proposals with a full-time person for Region 7. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just something, because that opportunity to not just attend, where they attend that first year for us, but the second year there's a different kind of expectation, mm -hmm. you know, as an attendee. Mm -hmm. So the first one you're just going and just kind of looking around, kind of figuring yeah. out what's happening, and then that next piece is what does that look like? Because I think the opportunity even for scholarshiping mm -hmm. graduate students, which is one of those things that's kind of been talked about a lot, you know, what would that actually look like and how formalized would that be? But I think we have to be formalized enough that we're going to start pushing it, you know, really early to get those, you know, people in the door. And what does that actually look like? Because yeah, we talked a lot about Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, in different times we've set aside certain amounts of money, but I think part of it is we don't know who we're going after. You know what I mean? Which if every institution you were able to identify, and part of that too becomes there's a lot of community college employees that are in four-year schools master programs. And, you know, is it going to be one of those things that if you're full-time in higher ed that you're not eligible for a graduate um, scholarship opportunity? And I know that's how Nakata does it, and there are always questions about. So, but I'm a grad student, but they don't read the fine print that's, you know, if you are an employee of the institution and you're a grad student, that's very different than being a full-time grad student who works a part-time job on a campus. And, and funding available, you know, typically if you're full-time, you have a better chance for money than what a grad student would have. You know, and so I don't know if that's a survey trying to get different people, you know, somebody from each institution, um, you know, to identify, you know, what would that look like? Do any of y'all have any questions for Patty? Anything you want to know in particular? What happened to Heather? I don't know. I just noticed that she was gone. <laughs> Because can everybody actually see their stuff in Google? Yeah, right now it's very um, disorganized. Okay. And that's partly, I guess, all of our fault for not keeping it organized. And so when you go to find things, it's, they're really hard to find. And so we just need to go in and clean up all of it and just put them in. I don't even know whether to do it by year or to do it by... Um, well, I think it comes it kind of as what you have. I mean, and everybody does... You know, everybody's OCD about files is a, is a little bit different. Um, you know, for me, it's just like I hate to have to hunt. I want to go, you know, because originally it was set up by each of the positions. And so there was stuff that was placed, the stuff that was related to each of those positions was there. But then there was like a scan project folder that just right. had, because we didn't have everything, but everything that we had, Right. You know, yeah. I had student workers that sorted everything by date to try to put it in date order. So at least if you got into a file that was scanned, yeah. you can see the progression and things. But I think part of that is, you know, what what are we doing? What are the expectations? You know, because I think the easiest one, or well, the easiest two probably, 
come to the secretary who is maintaining for each year the agenda and the minutes, right? I mean, which that's pretty clear cut what that's going to look like. Or the treasurer who mm -hmm. is, yeah. you know, by the year that you're filing, you know, and you have, Thanks, yeah, and you have access to the last form that was filed with the IRS so you know what it looks like when that transitions. Because up until now, those forms typically are not time consuming. It's just the issue that if you forget and you don't file, what could happen at that point? Because trying to go back in and get reactivated now, um, well, and you know, politically, one of the things a lot of people are like, why should we have nonprofits? Why aren't they paying taxes? And you know, I think there's that point that you have a better opportunity being grandfathered in. <laughs> if you stay current and make sure that, that the contact person for that is current. Because when it does, you know, kind of fall by the wayside, that becomes a huge issue of trying to figure out who is the person right. whose name is currently on there and where's the stuff been going. Because we don't have centralized mailing. And, um, and I, I don't know that that would ever work just because people in our profession are so mobile. I mean... Yeah. You know, they may stay within the state and stay involved, but like if they leave it, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things that people do leave. People go to other states. People move to a different role that would not, you know, allow them the opportunity to continue in that position um, because it's not part of their role. But, but being able to kind of look through those things, you know, because I think from a perspective, if you're brand new and you don't know what you're even looking for, to know whether it's there or not. Right. You know, what does that look like? And, you know, very key things, obviously the bylaws, you know, having the file where the bylaws are there and what that actually looks like, you know, each time. Because I know for people like who will be new, they're like, what are you talking about? You know, because some people host conferences and they're on their bylaws. There's, you know, people are just paying a conference fee to show up. There's not a structural um, organization. Uh, the Kansas Student Affairs Conference is very much that way. They have a bank account that's maintained at one state school institution, whether that school's involved or not. And it's an issue because every time somebody leaves that institution, how do you get access to the money for the conference? Where they're not doing, you know, they didn't get recognized under the IRS for anything. And so they're basically, covering the money of the conference. Um, they may have a little bit of carryover to the next year, but literally all they do is host a conference each year. And so, you know, what does that actually look like? And so I think a lot of times people are like, I don't know what that means. What do you mean we have bylaws? Mm -hmm. You know, from a structure of like dues and, and different things too. Questions? No questions that you have? Is there anything you wanted to know more about the bylaws? Because um, we know if we change anything, yeah. it has to be voted on by the membership. Yeah, so structurally within the bylaws, that would mean any positions, which, so when Nakata made the change for the region seven liaison, mm -hmm. um, you know, from that person, structurally that person is just, would be a sitting person right now, ex officio, couldn't vote would be information until you would adjust the bylaws and what does that actually mean because they technically report they were elected by NACADA mm -hmm. so you know what is their commitment really to CAN and and what would you expect that commitment because that's different across the state you know in our region everybody has at least one organization Texas has like seven um, which is part of the reason, like for a state like Texas that has so many that are vying, they only had one that would allow anybody to be a member, which is why Texan was always the recognized one, because all the others are specific to a set of schools. Okay. You know, UT had a system and they had a, a group at Arlington and Austin, and A&M had the same thing, and so the only person who could ever elect their representative for Region 7 was Texan, because anybody in higher ed could belong to Texan. They couldn't belong to the other things. Um, but what does that look like now? Because mm -hmm. part of it, you know, there are a variety of states who don't have a representative. They don't have a state organization. They may or may not have a conference every year. Mm -hmm. They do more region-based things. And so 
for them to make sure within their region that every state was being represented because that wasn't necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. People would get on the slate, everybody would vote, and sometimes there might not be anybody from a small state who didn't have the numbers to ever mm -hmm. be able to challenge somebody from a different state. So, you know, going back where each state now, the members in Nakata, Okay. Yeah. Elect that that always now. assumed that every state had a state organization, so yeah, that's kind of good to know. Yeah, Region 7 and Region 5 do, mm -hmm. but we're the two largest, currently largest regions in Nakata, and we, we are actually, other than when you include Hawaii, which is in Region 10, distance-wise, we have the largest geographical yeah. distance from points to points. Wow. So. And what you know what that actually looks like so but you know what would that role really be of that person what would that look like because Nakata has made you know they're like these are the responsibilities of this elected position this person needs to do that so what does that look like you know for you mm -hmm. yeah, what kind of information do we need to get from them right because is that a position you know that person technically wouldn't have to be a member of CAN. Right. So does that change the reimbursement process for region and annual because they're not elected by CAN? I mean, there's a lot of CAN members who are NACADA members, but they're really not elected by CAN, they're elected by NACADA. You know, it's not like we're ratifying them or approving their appointment yeah. or, or anything like that. You know, and, and NACADA has said, this person will serve for this long, Here's what their job duties are. We expect them to be involved with that region committee and what that looks like. And, you know, from a perspective, it's not that CAN can't afford to do it, right? But is that something that you would actually, you know, continue to do? Because that commitment that they make is not a commitment their state would support them. It's a commitment their institution would. So when you're looking at elected position, that's a commitment from your institution that they will make it possible for you to do your duties and be at the places that, that you need to be. Okay. All right. Anything else? I can't think of anything. Anything else you need to share? I would say from an election perspective, mm -hmm. the bylaws are pretty clear. Mm -hmm. So when you have a slate of people, even if you get them that day, you have to have a vote then. Okay. At that point, because I, you know, because sometimes there are no people right. in four line. That more often than not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and so when there is, there are no people. It's that process of coming back, sending it out, saying this is what the deadline will be. You know, reaching out to those people. Is this something? I mean, do they understand what the duty is? Which duties are? Yeah. I think hey. pretty specific. Hey. I think that did come up when we were planning this conference is because there's nothing in the bylaws about taking nominations from from the basically the floor of the conference. Yeah. So is that just something that came from? That's always been the opportunity. Okay. And part of the and I mean like in the '90s even mm -hmm. it's been the opportunity because sometimes there are people who for whatever reason are not getting the communication stuff, um, who would show up at a conference and go. I never even remit, you know, I never received anything. Okay. And so, you know, we have we have people and we've I don't remember seriously ever not having someone nominated from the floor for a position. Because even positions that had people slated, yeah, right. there have been people. Heather was very not in favor of doing that this year and we didn't we didn't we didn't do she didn't take nominations from the floor and that was that was a conversation we had before going. Yeah. I'm just curious if, if that was just historically yeah. a thing that was done or, yeah. Well, and honestly, from a perspective of being leaving a conference and not having an elected person, mm -hmm. that's a very, that's more of a recent issue than, I mean, there would be people that we, you could still nominate from the floor. The only thing that you couldn't nominate from the floor were award winners. Right. Okay. You know, from the award, because yeah, you if you're given a yeah. plaque, you know, you yeah. kind of need to know. Sorry, yeah. I mean, there's just yeah. no way to yeah, no, to turn that around and, and recognize I that. Think, I think Heather's only concern, and I and I kind of understand where she was coming from with not taking nominations from the floor, was that it would be somebody who maybe didn't understand the responsibilities or didn't understand mm -hmm. kind of what would be required of them. It was just somebody who thought, you know, this is something I want to get involved with. 
without without really yeah. considering what what it would mean to yeah. be a member of CAN. And it, it, yeah, I think that was the, her, her biggest one of her biggest concerns. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think you know from a perspective, we we've got to do something to get community colleges back involved. So, at um, annual at the region meeting and then you break out into states mm -hmm. and Seward County was like we got taken off the list and we haven't gotten anything for the last three years okay. and Patsy was very adamant about that um, and I from when we were sitting there in the meeting I took her email and I sent her the link to the website because I said you know Patsy it's and Patsy's a person who had been involved mm -hmm. not in leadership but I mean they were it's pretty so regular involved. attendees that would come different places and you know just having that opportunity because I think if we can get back to getting some of Johnson County used to be a huge involvement with CAN they were I mean they would bring 30 people huge because is it you may tell me if I'm wrong because the membership person's not here but so usually we get that email list from people who signed up for the conference right and if they didn't sign up that year they get dropped off the list Question mark? <laughs> they shouldn't get dropped off the okay. list. They should be on a different okay. list. Right. Um, so there used to be, there were like two email lists in Google. One was current members and one was people who had been members like in the last five years. Okay. Because sometimes, you know, I'm thinking if I'm Seward and you say it's at Johnson yeah. County, yeah. I may be driving from Liberal to Johnson County. Right. <laughs> yeah. But Wichita is a whole different thing. Or, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just that difference. But having those lists, because if you can keep those, because sometimes there's only one person at that institution that will remain constant, yeah, especially in sense. the community college yeah. system, and being able to reach out to them. Because I know on the membership list, um, there were also like provost and the dean of students, you know, at the community colleges that were on that list. Okay. Um, so that if nothing else they were getting the information and could share it but you know it would be interesting to find out why are community college people not participating anymore because i do think that's a huge difference in the membership from what it used to be um, that there were quite a few you know that were actively hutch was very active um, pratt was active um, Seward was, Dodge, um, Johnson County, of course, was, and then like Allen County, they even have people serve on the board from Allen County. So, I mean, just a variety, and Labette had some participation too, but, you know, figuring out who those people are to keep them on the list, you know, because I think sometimes it's, even if they're on the list and you're saying, hey, we're sitting there to inform you about this, you know, if you're no longer in an advising position, who would be the person at your school? Because typically, if they've stayed at that school, to where the email's actually going through, you know what that what that would look like. But membership would typically, if it bounced back, would keep track of that to see. So do we have somebody else at that school that we need to to reach out to if that person has actually left because the email's coming back is you know no longer valid at that point. But I think that's yeah. Thank you very much yeah. for coming. Thank you, Patty. Not a problem. Yeah. yeah, and I would say too, you know, when, as you're starting to think about the stuff for um, the conference in 18, mm -hmm. that seems a long way, but <laughs> I would um, reach out and Nakata now that the Jared, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Jared is the elective part of Nakata, it may be that he needs to reach out to Nakata, mm -hmm. but you know, would it be possible to send an early email? You know, because they've always been gracious when you ask them. They're not going to give you the list. Right. But from a perspective where they would send something out, you know, to see, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because you do as an allied organization, when you pay that, you submit a list of your dues paying members mm -hmm. that are current that year, you know, and they should be able to tell you from, I mean, not immediately when you send it, but once they have that information logged as an ally, you know, how many of those are duplicates or is the Kansas membership really a ton of people mm -hmm. who are not members of CAN? You know, is that something that they would be, you know, willing to provide so that you can, you know, have an opportunity? Of course, there are people who say, do not share my email, and everybody has that right to do that, but I don't think that's a 
Right. Okay. In Region 7, that's really not been that many people because more people want to know what's going on yeah. as opposed to, I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty rare that they would do that, but that could help. So. Well, this helps a lot. No. It does. No. Yeah, so you know, what do you think? So okay. Go pick up, but the students. Yes, students, those people. Pre enrollment time. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh huh. Bye, Bye Holly. Take care. <sighs> and. Okay. You know, and from a perspective, if they decide, if they think that there's stuff that's that got deleted or something, mm -hmm. you know, if you if somebody would just reach out to me. And you might still. Have yeah, because if they would just give me the link, I could just dump. Because I have more stuff than what will fit on a jump drive. Okay. <laughs> you know, because on yeah. the jump drives, it was only per right. position, position, you know. Yeah. It was based on what that position looked like. So, okay. so yeah. yeah. Hey, is the building directory 